Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, Primary Care and Specialty Care Providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana. SIPhysicians.org The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars and administrators to improve teaching and learning in Indiana and around the world. More at education.indiana.edu Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company, Fiber Internet, HD and digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Indiana University Alumni Association, linking IU's network of over 650,000 alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships and volunteer opportunities. Alumni.iu.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. The Monroe County Council voted this week to enact a food and beverage tax. Coming up, we'll take a look at what it'll mean for your daily coffee habit and how other counties are funding their convention center expansions. Plus, state legislators set the agenda for the upcoming session this week. We'll take a look at the 2018 legislative priorities. A Christmas tradition at the heart of an Indiana town. The Martinsville Candy Kitchen has been hand making candy for nearly a century, but the shop is still a draw for kids and kids at heart. They've had this here for longer than I can even remember, so we just, we're just we excited now to bring the kids in and show them the same things that we saw when we were kids. How one family is having sweet success preserving a staple of a small community. These stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. The Indiana Office of Tourism Development says a record 79 million people visited the state last year. Several counties are hoping to cash in on Indiana's growing tourism industry by building new convention centers. As Barbara Brozier reports, the biggest challenge is coming up with money for the multi-million dollar projects. For the past decade, Monroe County leaders have lamented the need for a larger convention center. We know every reason why all these groups are not coming here, and most of the time it comes down to the dates were taken, there was no space in the convention center, or we couldn't get the adequate room block we needed at a hotel. Executive Director of Visit Bloomington, Mike McAfee, says the county loses 40 to 50 groups a year for those reasons. But he's confident that will soon change. Our forecasts um, are telling us it's going to be 15 to 20 million dollars in ex new expenditures in, in the county every year. Expansion of the convention center is estimated to cost about 72 million dollars, with a private developer footing about half of the bill to build an embassy suites hotel. To pay for its portion of the project, the Monroe County Council passed a 1 percent food and beverage tax this week. It wasn't an easy decision, and there's still plenty of opposition. Infrastructure, fire, police, those are good things that we need tax bases and tax revenues for to provide for the citizens. Expansions of hotels seems to me that those belong in the private sector. What's going to happen? They're going to have the same exact amount of people go through their drive through but next thing, oh wow, they're a little short of money, so instead of getting the double, they'll get the single. Doesn't sound like much, but you have the same amount of business, but you're going to have less of an average check or average dollar amount for order. This latte cost me about $5. Now with the food and beverage tax, I'll pay about five cents for that specific tax. If you get a latte once a week for a year, that's about $2.60. In terms of my, the people I work with on a daily basis, uh, I don't see 10 cents on a burger or a pizza creating a substantial impact on their lives. Some question the potential profitability of the convention center. 
But county leaders say the point isn't for the center itself to make all of the money. They say it will have a ripple effect on the greater Monroe County area. The tourism industry creates a job for about, it's like every $47,000 spent by visitors. The county is teaming up with Indianapolis-based Sun Development on the expansion, which is working on a similar project in Plainfield in Hendricks County. Construction is underway on a $25 million conference center there. The facility won't open until next year, but its first conference is already booked. We're hosting the Indiana Tourism Association in 2019. We have four other bids out right now um, for projects that will be coming in 19, 20, and 21. So, and these are pieces of business that we would have never been eligible to host. But this project is being funded differently than the convention center in Monroe County. Hendricks County is using a $6 million bond supported by its local innkeeper's tax. People who visit the county and rent rooms pay the levy. At 8%, it's among the highest rates in the state. We um, developed a partnership with the county that allowed us to put back a portion of that, which is 1.5 points of the eight, which is about 18.75% of the total. And we dedicated that for tourism development. And that helped us start a fund that would lead us to eventually be able to incentivize a development. Vigo County is also trying to figure out how to move forward with its plans for a convention center. The county banked on an agreement with Indiana State University for a $75 million project that included a renovation of the Holman Center Arena and building an adjoining convention center. But that partnership fell apart and the county is left to figure out how to move forward on its own. We want to revisit the food and beverage tax, so that may be something that we talk about in this session, whether it's something they'll act upon or not, I don't know. Um, we would love to be able to put those funds directly into the CIB so we can do community projects, the first one being a convention center. Regardless of how counties choose to pay for the convention centers, the process of bringing their visions to fruition is lengthy. Monroe County will start collecting its food and beverage tax in February, and it will take much longer before bonds can be issued for construction. And the question remains, with so many different counties jumping to build new facilities, will the capacity outgrow the demand? For Indiana News Desk, I'm Barbara Brozier. An accountant from Financial Solutions Group says food and beverage taxes tend to be more stable than an innkeeper's tax. During economic downturns, hotels often take a bigger hit than the restaurant business. While people may not spend as much during those times, they still go out to eat. Now, Barbara Brozier joins us for headlines. She has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. Open enrollment on the healthcare.gov marketplace ends today. The shortened enrollment period is about half as long as it was the previous year. Still, early numbers show about 79,000 Hoosiers had picked a plan on the healthcare.gov website through last week. Now, that's compared to about 71,000 at the same time last year. TV host and IU alumnus Tavis Smiley says he plans to fight back after being fired for alleged misconduct. B PBS made the announcement this week following an investigation into Smiley's behavior. Smiley has maintained close ties with Indiana University through the years. He funds a scholarship at the university and a building on campus is named after him. The university has declined to comment on the situation. Most Bloomington City Council members say they will vote to approve stricter regulations on downtown development. The council discussed the city's controversial proposal this week and voted to advance it. The changes would, among other things, reduce the height and density developers are automatically allowed to build. I want the buildings to look right. I want the buildings to be built, something that we'll be proud of to have for the next 100 years. A slew of new large structures have gone up in the city over the past decade. The council will take a final vote on the proposal at its Wednesday meeting. A former Vigo County School District administrator has been convicted in a kickback scheme that federal authorities say cost the district more than $100,000. Frank Bunnell was convicted of nine counts of wire fraud, one count of theft, in two counts of lying to federal investigators. In September, Fennell's co-defendant, former sheriff's deputy and school security liaison, Frank Shahady, pleaded guilty in the case. He's serving a 16-month sentence. 
Hoosier community groups and businesses have a message for Indiana's congressional delegation. Find a solution for the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Act, or DACA. DACA allows minors who came to the country illegally to get an education and receive work permits. A representative from the Indiana Latino Institute says two-thirds of DACA recipients are under the age of 25. Some of these students don't even speak Spanish. Some of them haven't actually lived in their home countries. This is the reality of the students who we service at ILI. This is also the reality of the students who are all advocating here tonight. DACA expires March 6th and the Trump administration has tasked Congress with finding a permanent replacement. Monroe County is growing a, is joining a growing list of communities suing opioid manufacturers for their roles in the nationwide epidemic. The lawsuit claims deceptive advertising regarding the effects of opioids. According to the CDC, Indiana had an average of 109 prescriptions for every 100 residents. Communities say if they win, they plan to use the funds to directly fight the epidemic. Monroe County is the first county under a new law to offer a two-year contract to a needle exchange program. Commissioners voted to extend the agreement with the Indiana Recovery Alliance through the end of 2019. That to overcome stigma like this, it tends to be that people have to have personal contact with somebody. Um, right? So, so it's easy for me to make up a villain in my head and, and have a very clear picture of what that is, but then when my nephew, right, or my aunt uh, or a closer family member is actually experiencing that, that's when the tune starts changing. So we're seeing that right now. Abert says the stigma against people with addiction makes it difficult to get approval for even a one-year renewal. Needle exchanges in other Indiana counties have been shut down or denied funding this year, including in Lawrence County and Madison County. And a community Christmas tree in Vincennes is winning mixed reviews for its likeness to the scrawny tree from A Charlie Brown Christmas. This year, the city put up a 70-foot pine tree and hung a large red ball from the top. Some residents took to social media to criticize the tree. Many local critics were confused, but once they realized it was a Charlie Brown tree, they appreciated the joke. Maybe they were just being Grinches. Joe. I can see the confusion though. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Barbara. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. What issues will dominate the legislative session that's just around the corner? Will this be the year lawmakers address the state's alcohol laws? Some African American families are turning to homeschooling to avoid what they see as a bias in public education. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. The WTIU WFIU News Team connects Indiana to the world. We bring you the top news of the day on radio, TV, and online. We round up the stories that have people talking each week and dig deep into the issues that affect your community the most. The WTIU WFIU News Team is where you are and telling your story. Ten thousand. Fifteen? Fifteen, you think? Twenty. Twenty-one thousand? Six hundred. Twenty. Eighteen five. Twenty-four. It's at least forty. Look, yeah, look at 4, it. Forty-five hundred thousand. Six fifty. Twenty. Six fifty. This textile would be worth about a half a million dollars. Half a million? No way! I knew it. It's just a blanket. Laying on the back of a chair. Well, sir, you have a national treasure. Wow. A national treasure. Congratulations. I can't believe this. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Governor Eric Holcomb joined state lawmakers this week to lay out his agenda for the 2018 session. The annual legislative conference focused on, among other things, alcohol sales, marijuana legislation, and infrastructure investment. Holcomb says the state is in good financial shape to tackle any challenge. We still enjoy a AAA credit rating. We've maintained that. We have almost $2 billion, $1.8 in reserves, so we're, we're able to weather any tough times that may come down the road. Holcomb also spoke about his plans to help small communities update their roads and bridges. 
The 20-year plan for Indiana's infrastructure went into effect this summer. Now state and local officials are looking at long-term spending to address road and bridge rehabilitation, as well as spending on transit and commerce projects. So to say that we, that we invest in, in a way that we want to get that money back right away, it just doesn't happen. We tend to view those investments totally differently. The panel also discussed rapid transit for Indianapolis and a new port to bring more commerce to the state. Other issues at the legislative conference, alcohol. Two leading voices on Indiana alcohol issues say there's little chance lawmakers will take action to allow convenience and grocery stores to sell cold beer. Beverly Gard, who led an alcohol study commission and Senate Public Policy Committee Chairman Ron Alting, both agree the issue is a non-starter in the coming session. Selling car carry out cold beer in Indiana is a right primarily afforded to packaged liquor stores, which actively lobby to keep it that way. Attorney General Curtis Hill remains skeptical about the value of CBD oil. He told a panel there is not enough information on CBD to allow the sale of it in Indiana. So I think it's important if we look at it from a medicinal standpoint, there needs to be appropriate research, and I'm not saying that I would be opposed to the research, but there needs to be legitimate research that determines what types of maladies this particular substance is geared for will help and assist. The state legislature approved a bill earlier this year to legalize CBD oil for certain types of epilepsy. Hill issued an opinion last month saying he thinks possession and sale of CBD oil is illegal except for those covered under that law. The 2018 legislative session kicks off January 3rd. Homeschooling has traditionally been for white families who keep their kids home for religious or spiritual reasons. But that's changing. About a third of homeschooled students now are minorities and their numbers are rising. But it's not necessarily for religious reasons. As Miranda Fulmore reports, many parents are doing it to make sure their children are safe. Yuzuri Assad homeschools her four children ranging in age from 4 to 12 years old. Class begins every morning with meditation. Take a deep breath in, close your eyes. A lot of afternoons they end up here, at the Indianapolis Public Library. The library has a center dedicated to black literature and culture. As a, a country in general, there's a cultural bias, of course, because the storytellers are going to make themselves look the best. And that's not to say there's anything wrong with that. It's just if you're educating a diverse environment, in a, a diverse environment, then you need to present educational materials that are diverse as well. Before they were even married, Yuzuri and her husband Bashiri decided they would homeschool their children. And the best way that I could think of doing it is taking my perspective and educating myself on those particular things and then passing that on to my children without having to worry about re-educating them after they've gotten indoctrinated in one particular system, only to have them have to figure everything else out all over again like I had to do. Black parents are one of the fastest growing demographics who are opting to homeschool their kids. Homeschooling is the flagship movement of education in this country today, especially because of African American boys being labeled. That's Joyce Burgess. She's the CEO and co founder of the National Black Home Educators. She's homeschooled her five children and now helps homeschool other kids around her home state of Louisiana. She says there are a variety of reasons why African American families choose to homeschool, but the most common one is parents fear public school will taint their children. Tainted meaning they don't want them to be bullied. They don't want them, and, and nowadays parents are even more concerned about safety. If I send my child to this school, is my child gonna come home today? And so parents say, you know what, Joyce? I just don't want my child to be in a system that's going to make them feel that they're not somebody. I could not possibly put her in a school environment and tell them that she wants to do something and they tell her no because that baby will get sent home a whole lot. <laughs> she will get in arguments with her teachers because she's, she's not easily swayed. 
Missouri says many factors played into their final decision to homeschool their children, including the punishment used in school against African Americans. Studies show black students are less likely to be recommended for gifted and advanced classes. And multiple studies show that African American children, especially boys, are disproportionately likely to be suspended or arrested. The way that the school systems are these days and you know, it's not a level playing field all the time. And there's a lot of holes in the educational process that I think could be filled if they were correctly addressed. And there's only certain, there's a certain way that you have to address certain issues. But homeschooling comes with a price. Usuri earns some money working side jobs, but the family largely has to make ends meet on what Bashiri makes. Plus, they have to cover all of the kids' schooling expenses out of pocket. But I mean, if we had, if we absolutely had to, like if I had to work um, a full-time job so that things could be different for our family for whatever reason, I would put them in school, but it would take me a long time to find one if I had to. And I would be killing myself to get them out. Uzuri says in her experience, other forms of schooling force children to bend into a mold that's not natural in order to make other people comfortable. She says it's a gamble she's not willing to take. I cannot put them in an environment where they're treated unfairly for no reason. And that goes from educational to spiritual, personal, physical, emotional. None of that will be suppressed. I won't allow it. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Miranda Fulmore. And it's easy to homeschool in Indiana. State law exempts homeschool students from the curriculum and program requirements of traditional public school. Now this means homeschool families aren't required to report attendance or curriculum to the state. A zoo in Evansville is using an artificial environment to try to trick a rare salamander into breeding. As Sarah Whitmire reports, the goal is to return the salamanders to their natural habitat. The Mesker Park Zoo's artificial stream includes chillers and pumps to mimic a natural flowing river. We actually have to keep this water at a not a constant temperature unlike the juveniles. We actually make it so that it goes up and down with the season. So in the middle of summer, this water is 74, 75 degrees. The dead of winter, it's going to hopefully be down to into the 40s. And at that time of the year, they don't eat, they don't hunt, they don't move much, they don't do a whole lot. They just kind of hunker down. The hope is captive eastern hellbenders will breed and lay eggs and stream. If they do, that would be a first for the species that's North America's largest salamander. Their numbers are shrinking in the wild. Dams and human habitats are segmenting their populations and making it so males and females can't meet each other. They've been identified because they can't be found. That's the biggest problem. Uh, so their population was once high uh, and they're what we call an indicator species. So if this species is well in the wild, that means the water quality is good, the environment's good, there's, you know, there's, a, there's an equilibrium between predator prey, humans don't really have that much influence on them, things like that. Pliss says there's likely fewer than 50 eastern hellbender salamanders living in the wild in Indiana. Hellbenders can grow two or more feet long and live up to 30 years. The salamanders at the zoo aren't full grown yet. The zoo plans to release them back into the wild as soon as they're able to breed enough. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Sarah Whitmire. And a holiday tradition that dates back nearly a century is still alive in downtown Martinsville. Barbara Brosia joins us now for more. Well, Joe, this is definitely the time of year to visit the Candy Kitchen on Martinsville's Town Square. It's one of the few places where you can see people make hand-pulled candy canes. Every weekend in December, people travel from all over Indiana to Martinsville's Candy Kitchen. They come to see the owners craft candy by hand, and they also get a bit of a history lesson. The Candy Kitchen started in 1919 by Jimmy Zapapas. That's his picture right there. The Candy Kitchen is the only business that's been on Martinsville Square for nearly 100 years. It's changed hands and location several times, but one thing has always remained the same. He's gonna put the red coloring in it and that'll make the stripes. It takes an hour to cook it and then about a half hour to put it together and then an hour to pull the canes out. So it's a two and a half hour process to make the canes and then we have to bag them and tag them all. The staff here will make more than 30,000 by the end of the year. And for owner John Badger, it's truly a labor of love. 
I work a full-time job, and then after I get off that job, I come in here and come start making candy canes. We make candy canes up through the night. Badger and his wife bought the shop in 2004. They watched as a lot of Martinsville businesses closed their doors. They didn't want to see that happen to the candy kitchen. And by saving the shop, they help preserve a beloved Indiana tradition. We just, we're excited now to bring the kids in and show them the same things that we saw when we were kids. Badger makes candy canes throughout the week, but the busiest day is Saturday. He spends nearly eight hours pulling the canes as children press their faces against the glass to watch. It gives families a chance to see a process that's rarely done by hand anymore. Many weekends, he's here as early as 6 a.m. cranking out the first batch, and it's always a family affair. We're going to make a batch after closing hours with all the grandkids helping make candy canes. Badger's hopeful those grandkids will carry the tradition on after he retires. But he's not planning on stopping anytime soon. I enjoy making the candy to make, make people happy. And Joe, they celebrate wow. a big anniversary in 2019. They turn 100 years old. Wow, very cool. Thanks, Barbara. As always, more online at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, Primary Care and Specialty Care Providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana. SIPhysicians.org The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching and learning in Indiana and around the world. More at education.indiana.edu Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company, Fiber Internet, HD and digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Indiana University Alumni Association, linking IU's network of over 650,000 alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships and volunteer opportunities. Alumni.iu.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you.